Well, good morning. I want to welcome everybody to church across all of our locations, Cartersville, Daresville, Rome. Grateful to have everybody in the house today. And before we dive into the sermon, I need to get one thing on your radar. And if you've been around Cross Point for any length of time, this probably won't surprise you. If you're new, we'll see how it lands, all right? But, but several years ago, our elders instituted a sabbatical policy for the pastors and ministers of our church and that policy states that for every five years of full-time service, the pastor or minister is eligible for a four-week sabbatical, and for every 10 years of full-time service, an eight-week sabbatical. Now, the goal of the policy is to protect and care for our pastors and ministers, all in hopes of increasing their longevity, both at Cross Point and in ministry. You see, according to statistics from Barna Research, Focus on the Family and Fuller Seminary, Almost 1,500 pastors leave their ministry positions every month due to burnout, moral failures, or issues within the church. 80% of pastors feel discouraged in their roles. 50% of pastors say they would leave the ministry if they could, but they have no other way of making a living. 80% of seminary and Bible school graduates leave the ministry within their first five years. 70% of pastors constantly fight depression, and only one out of 10 pastors retire as a pastor. Okay, look, I don't share all that to whine about how hard it is to do what I do. Uh, honestly, I love what I do. I can't imagine doing anything else with my life, and I love doing it here at Cross Point because you people are amazing, and you make it very easy to do what I do. The reason I'm telling you all this is really simple. Number one, I want you to know why we proactively care for our pastors and ministers in this way. Uh, we work really hard to keep our staff healthy so that we can shepherd in a way that honors God and helps you. But then secondly, in just a few short weeks, I will be taking an eight-week sabbatical. Okay, I just hit 10 years at Cross Point back in January. It's crazy, January 1st. Hey, thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. But yeah, January 1st, 2012 was my first day here. And so just hit 10 years. It's been an amazing ride. And so I'm gonna be gone for most of June and July. I'll, I'll leave Monday, June the 6th, come back. Uh, or I'll be gone, excuse me, through Sunday, July 31st. And while I'm gone, our staff team will take care of the day-to-day -day like they always do. And I've invited a ton of guys to come and preach in my place while I'm gone. Most of them are guest preachers. A few of them are gonna be from within the house. And I want you to be here. Don't not be here, because I'm not here, okay? Be here to hear from them, to honor them. I promise you're gonna be blessed by them. But I also just wanna ask that you'd pray for me while I'm away. Uh, many of you know it's been a crazy, crazy season for our family and so I'm looking forward to just some time away to rest, uh, to be with my girls, to be with the Lord. And if you would pray for my rest, my spiritual rejuvenation, uh, for our family to have great quality time together, that would be much appreciated. And I just want to also thank not only you for praying, but our elders for taking care of us in this way. Uh, I love our guys, and I love the fact that they take very seriously making sure that we're all healthy so that we can do what we do and so thank you guys so much for allowing me to get away. It is a joy and honor to be your pastor, and I pray that I get to do it for many, many, many years to come, all right? So, all right, with that said, if you have a Bible, grab it. Let's go to the book of Revelation together. Revelation chapter two is where we're gonna be. We're in week four of this series called Seven, and in the series, we're studying the seven letters written to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, and today we come to the longest of the letters, and I would argue the most difficult of the letters. I'm gonna just warn you, we got some hard plowing today, all right? I was tired after preaching this on Thursday. It's a hard sermon to preach, it is a hard sermon to hear, but we're gonna get through it together, okay? And by the way, it is desperately needed. But it's very interesting that this letter came to the church it came to. Because this long letter and this difficult letter was sent to the church in the least prominent of all the cities. Thyatira was not a big city like Ephesus or Smyrna or Pergamum. It was a small city like Cartersville or Adairsville or Rome. And so if you can imagine King Jesus sending us a letter as opposed to the church in downtown Atlanta, that's what we're working with here. Thyatira was a small city and in addition, it was a market city. So a lot of commercial goods produced there, a lot of commercial goods sold there, things like bronze and wool and clothing and the dyes used in clothing. In fact, in Acts 16, we meet this lady, her name is Lydia. She was from Thyatira, first Christian in the city. And she was a fashion designer, a businesswoman, known for selling purple goods. 
Well, much of the purple dye that was used in her goods, guess where it came from? Her, her city, the city of Thyatira. Now, as a result of all these industries being present there, there were different trade guilds in Thyatira. If you think of a guild, think about a union today, you know, association of workers overseeing different parts of industry and fighting for workers and ensuring longevity. This was the purpose of the trade guild. And if you wanted to be successful in your specific industry, it was expected that you would be a part of your guild. Now, here was the problem. Every guild was associated with the pagan god. And so they were going to all the pagan festivals. They were making pagan sacrifices, eating meals in pagan temples. Uh, they were even taking part in the sexual immorality that marked many of these pagan worship rituals. And so if you decided, you know what, I don't wanna do that, it would impact your livelihood in a massive way. Imagine it like this. Let's say you go to work tomorrow and your boss calls everybody into the conference room. Got an announcement to make. All right, here's the new weekly rhythm. Monday, 8 a.m., we're gonna gather together and make a sacrifice to the pagan god of our industry and then we're all gonna have an orgy. And if you don't wanna do that, you can't work here. And so let's just imagine you're like, yeah, well, I'm out, I'm not doing that. And, and so you quit the job and you start applying for other jobs and every other job you apply for, the requirement is the same. This is what was happening in the city of Thyatira. William Barclay explains it like this. If in Thyatira, the Christian merchant or trader or craftsman was a member of his trade guild and participated in its ceremonies, he would protect his business interests and ensure his material prosperity. If he refused to become a member of such a guild and refused to participate in its ceremonies, he was very definitely committing commercial suicide and would very soon be faced with poverty and even bankruptcy. So do you hear the decision facing the Christians in this city? Compromise or don't eat. Compromise or be homeless. Compromise or lose everything. Here's the letter Jesus sends to the church in Thyatira. We're gonna pick it up in verse 18. And to the angel of the church write, the words of the Son of God who has uh, eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Now, we've explained every week of the series that the angel in these letters, these are the pastors of the churches. Uh, there are a couple of views on this, but the Greek word there is angelos. It means messenger, and it can refer to a human messenger or a heavenly messenger. I believe it was a human messenger. That uh, Jesus was sending these letters to the pastors so that the pastors could share them with the churches. And Jesus tells this specific church that he is the son of God. Now, it's interesting. This is the only time that title is used for Jesus in Revelation. We see it all throughout the New Testament but it's actually a title that comes out of the Old Testament. I'll give you a couple of examples. Second Samuel chapter seven, which is a very, very important chapter in your Bible, by the way. It's one that you should know and learn and be familiar with. It's where we find the Davidic covenant. King David is ruling as king over Israel at the time, and he's struggling with the fact that God is living outside in a tent. He is the king, he's in this amazing palace, God's in a tent, because at this point in Israel's history, the temple hadn't been built yet. So God is still living out there in the tabernacle. Well, David decides, I'm gonna build God a house. It's not right for me to live in here and God to live out there, so I'm gonna build God a house. Well, God comes to this guy named Nathan. He was a prophet and a friend of David's. And he says, Nathan, I want you to tell David, he's not gonna build me a house, I'm gonna build him a house. And then he makes these unbelievable promises. Listen, he says, David, I'm gonna use you to raise up a king and a kingdom for myself. This will be an eternal kingdom ruled by a son belonging to me, and that son will secure my people and give them rest from all their enemies. Well, then you go over to Psalm chapter two, and you find David writing what is known as a messianic psalm, a psalm about God's promised king, and he describes that king as a son. Here's what Jesus is saying. I'm the son. I am the son of God. I am the promised king. And so this title, son of God, then speaks of his authority. And we see that authority in the physical description that he gives. Eyes like a flame of fire, feet like burnished bronze. Here's what he's saying. I see all and I judge all. I see all and I judge all. Listen, I'm gonna say this because I think some of you need to hear it. You can't hide anything from Jesus. He sees all. Isn't it silly how we do this at times? 
I go, I don't want him to see me sinning in this way, so I'm just going to kind of go over here and hide it. I don't want him to see me struggling in this way, so I'm going to just try to make it through on my own. It's incredibly silly. He sees it. He knows about it. You might as well be honest with him, right? He's the only one that can give you the power you need to overcome that sin in your life, so you might as well tell him what you're struggling with. He's the only one that can give you what you need to overcome whatever struggle it is that you're facing, so you might as well take it to him instead of trying to get through it on your own, right? He sees all. Don't hide from Christ, just be honest. But in addition, he judges all. This is the picture. His feet like burnished bronze, it's one of Jesus treading on his enemies. And so the point is simply this, Jesus will not let sin go unpunished. Any sin, Jesus will not let it go unpunished. You see, you as a sinful person, you can either put your faith in him as the one who suffered sin's punishment for you so you can go free, or you can reject Jesus as the one who suffered sin's punishment and you can suffer punishment yourself. But either way, Jesus Christ will judge sin. And I want you to keep that in mind because we'll come back to that in just a few moments, all right? But in verse 19, Jesus goes on to say this. I know your works. Your love and your faith and your service and patient endurance and that your latter works exceed the first. Now, herein lies the great blessing of Jesus seeing all. I know when some of you hear that, you're like, I don't want him to see all. He sees all, okay? But, but here is the great blessing of Jesus seeing all. He sees the good we do even when no one else sees it. That's really good news, isn't it? Like, he doesn't just see your sin. He sees all of your victories in addition, he celebrates those victories. Every week here at Crosspoint, we have a staff meeting, we get all of our people into a room together, and one of the things we do is we share God's stories. All right, let's celebrate what God is doing in the life of the church, whose lives are being changed, who met Jesus, who stepped up to serve, right? What stories are we hearing from groups? And so we just go around and, and we kind of popcorn, like, you know, praise moments, if you will. Here's what Jesus is doing, the same thing. He is commending and praising this church for what God is doing in the life of the church. And he commends them for five things. Number one, their love. The word love there is the Greek word agape. And it's the same word that's often used to describe the love of God. And so these people were loving other people in the same way God loved them. Secondly, their faith. Their faith. And this is an active faith. So this was not a church that just talked a big game. Y- y'all know the kind of people I'm talking about that talk a big game? They wanna tell you about what they say they believe, but what they say they believe hasn't impacted their life at all. That was not these people. Uh, These people talked the talk and they walked the walk. They lived out the very things they professed. Number three, he praised them for their service. The word service there in the Greek is diakonia. It's where we get our English word deacon. And in this day and age, it was a word used to describe a table waiter or a bond servant. So in other words, these were floor people. Okay, if you've been around Crosspoint, you know what I'm talking about when I say floor people. If you don't, I preached a message on, or a message series on it a few months ago. I'll make it easy. Just go read John 13. That's what I'm talking about. This is where we find the story of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the night before his crucifixion, leaving a table, getting on the floor, assuming the position of the lowliest servant in a household, washing his disciples' feet. One of the greatest acts of service and sacrifice the world has ever seen. That was the church in Thyatira. These people were pouring themselves out for the sake of others. That's the kind of church we wanna be, right? Like we wanna be a people who show up week after week and we sit up all high and mighty acting like we deserve to be served. You don't deserve to be served, neither do I. We wanna be people coming in lowly and humble, pouring ourselves out for the sake of other people. He praises them for their service. Number four, their endurance. Their endurance. I've told you this over the past few weeks. Every single one of these churches was suffering persecution. Every single one of these churches was suffering rejection in some way, cultural pressure to conform. This was a church that was standing faithful in the midst of it all. Persevering, enduring, following after Christ. And then finally, he praises them for their spiritual growth. The phrase that you see there, your latter works exceed the first, that lets us know that the problem in this church was very different than it was at Ephesus. When I talked about Ephesus in week one, this was a church that lost its first love, right? They started strong and then they petered out. Not so here. In Thyatira, they had actually built upon that first love. 
The works they were doing present day better than the ones they were doing in their former days. They were growing and they were maturing over time. Sounds like a pretty amazing church, doesn't it? It does, but Jesus has a charge. And it's a charge that we see him bringing against them starting in verse 20. This, by the way, is where the message starts to get difficult. So just hang in, okay? Here's what he says. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. And so here's the charge. You are tolerating Jezebel. All right, who in the world's Jezebel? Well, you gotta go back to the Old Testament to figure that out. You find her story in 1 Kings 16 through 21 in 2 Kings chapter nine. Here's what I'll tell you about Jezebel. Chick was crazy. <laughs> it's why we don't name our kids Jezebel, okay? <laughs> if you're looking for a good cat name, there's one for you. Okay, Jezebel. <laughs> She's crazy. Foreign princess from this city called Sidon, which is in modern day Lebanon, and she married one of Israel's kings, a guy named Ahab, terrible king. This guy actually did more evil in the sight of the Lord than any of the other kings before him, and she married Ahab for political reasons. And so instead of coming into Israel and abandoning all of her pagan gods, she just brought them with her. And she decided, you know what? You can worship your God, but we're gonna worship all my gods too. And so her terrible king husband, Ahab, built this temple to Baal, and he also set up an Asherah pole, these places of worship to these false gods. And consequently, the nation of Israel began to engage in idolatry and sexual immorality. Okay, side note. This is just a quick principle for all the single people in the room. Okay, God put you on my heart and mind this week, so I thought I'd take a moment just to speak to you, okay? So this is free, by the way, not really a part of the message. Single people, listen to me. And this is me trying to help you, okay? What do we learn from Jezebel and Ahab? Dudes in the room, stay away from crazy women. <laughs> single women in the room, stay away from crazy dudes, okay? And listen, I'm trying to be serious, okay? I know I'm being funny, but I'm trying to be serious. I'm trying to love you so you can take it or leave it. I, I want you to know, single people, the greatest decision you will ever make in your life outside of deciding to follow Jesus is deciding who you're gonna marry. It is a promise. And I'm telling you, if you marry someone who has no interest in following Jesus and loving him with their whole heart, you are in for a very painful ride. And I wanna save you from that. And so my caution and my encouragement to you would be this, date wisely, Marry rightly because you don't want to spend your life with a Jezebel or Ahab, all right? Single people, I hope that helps some of you. Break up with them if you need to today, okay? <laughs> Prayer team be down here. We'll help you if you need it, okay? <laughs> here was the problem in Thyatira. There was a crazy woman in this church acting like Jezebel. Okay, in the other churches that we've studied, a lot of the pressure and the, the, the problems were caused by groups of people. In this church, it was caused by a woman, an individual who showed up, claimed to be a prophetess. I am here, sent by God, speaking for God to all of you, the people of God. But then she was teaching and seducing the church to do the very opposite of what God wanted them to do. She was preaching what the Old Testament Jezebel was preaching. You can worship your God, and all the pagan gods of culture. Contextually speaking, her encouragement was this. Just participate in the trade guilds. Like, it, it'll be fine. Go to the festivals, eat the food sacrificed to idols, hang out in the temples, uh, go participate in the sexual immorality that, that is a, a part of all of these worship rituals. Like, worship your God, but also worship the pagan gods, because come on, your God doesn't want you to be homeless, does he? I mean, he doesn't really want you to lose your job, right? He don't want you to starve or, or be on the streets, does he? Look, a couple of weeks ago when I talked about Smyrna, I brought up the prosperity gospel. I think it's worth bringing up again today because this is yet another example that exposes the foolishness of that. The prosperity gospel is this false gospel that says that if you follow God and obey all of his commandments, that he will pour out external riches upon you and that will be the sign of his pleasure with you. It's garbage, you don't find it taught anywhere in the scriptures, okay? Here's what we learn from Thyatira. Sometimes those who are most prosperous are the most unfaithful. 
Sometimes those who look the most blessed are blessed, not because they're faithful to Christ, but because they've compromised. And this is what this woman is preaching, just compromise. Live with one foot in the church and one foot in the world, and God's gonna be fine with it. And here's what I need you to know today. God is not fine with compromise. He's not. And it's not because he's some cosmic killjoy. I know that's how some of you think about him, right? Like he's just out to ruin all my fun. No, he's not. It's that in the beginning, and you see this in Genesis 1 and 2, God created and designed all of life to work in a very specific way. And when we do life God's way, that's what honors him and that's what's best for us. Compromise dishonors God and it endangers us. And so, yes, he's concerned about his glory, but he's also concerned about your good. He is not okay with compromise. And you gotta know that because we live in a culture today that is marked by compromise. I mean, come on, you know it like I know it. We hear the Jezebel message preached every day, don't we? No, come on, you, you can worship your God, but let's not forget about all these pagan gods. Again, okay, if you wanna worship your God, that's fine, but let's also worship the God that is sex. No, 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 if you wanna worship your God, that's fine, but let's also worship the God of money and the God of power and the God of success and the God of possessions and the list goes on and on and on and on. And I, again, just want you to know that God is not okay with compromise. He's not okay with you being like the world to avoid being rejected by the world. And he's not okay with you compromising for the sake of your comfort and your prosperity. His expectation, if you know him, is this, to remain faithful to him no matter the rejection or discomfort you might face. And why do we do it? Here's the important question. Why do we do it? Because it's what Christ did for us. It's what Jesus Christ did for us. If we want to follow him and be like him, we do for him what he first did for us. Like when he put on human flesh and came here 2,000 years ago, he was rejected for us. Faithful to God the Father for us. Suffered for that faithfulness for us. And again, if we want to imitate Christ and be like Christ, then we have to do for him what he first did for us. Here's the truth. And if you're taking notes, you might want to write this statement down. You cannot please both God and the world. You cannot please both God and the world. And any attempt to please both at the same time results in you living a life that is displeasing to God. Okay, I didn't just make that up. There's another James that said it. And so I just wanna tell you what that James said. Um, He wrote a book in the Bible. He was the brother of Jesus. Here's what he says. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Here's what James is telling us. At some point, we have to choose. Is it gonna be him or is it gonna be them? Are we gonna side with culture or are we gonna side with Christ? We're gonna be friends with God, we're gonna be friends with the world. Are we gonna be at war with God or are we gonna be at war with the world? Because the truth is you can't be friends with both. And anybody, listen to me, anybody that tells you you can be is a Jezebel and according to Jesus, Jezebels cannot be tolerated. Let me show it to you, verse 21. It gets even harder, by the way. Hang in, everybody doing okay, yeah? Okay. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches heart and mind, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast what you have until I come. And so first off, it is very clear from this text that this woman had been confronted about her sin. I don't know if it was the church leaders, I don't know if it was someone within the congregation, but there was some Matthew 18 discipline taking place, church discipline taking place. Like someone had come to her and said, hey, uh, lady, you're saying some crazy stuff and you're doing some crazy stuff and I'm pretty sure God's not okay with this and I have to imagine she didn't listen and so a couple of them went back and she didn't listen to them and so a group came back and now here's King Jesus bringing this charge up before the church, Matthew 18, discipline. And so she had been confronted and Jesus himself had given her time to repent. 
which reveals the heart of Jesus towards sinful people. Oh man, this is so good. Jesus, listen, Jesus is not quick to throw the hammer down on sinners. You gotta get this. This is the truth of the gospel. No, instead, Jesus is gracious and he is patient and he is kind, not wishing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance and faith in him. Jesus gave this woman time to repent. Aren't you glad he gave you time to repent? He didn't just throw the hammer down on you quickly, right? Can I add in addition, this is also meant to be our heart toward other sinners. Like I know, man, it's, it's easy at times to just wanna throw the hammer down because we live in a very frustrating world and we see people divine God these days in very, very, very offensive ways, outlandish ways. And if you're anything like me, at times you watch this and you're like, come on, God, just, just throw it down, right? It's horrible. I mean, I'm just confessing before you. I don't know if you feel that way. Maybe you're holier than I am, but just being honest. Or, or, or you know, you got that person in your life who's acting like a straight heathen and you go and you tell them once, you gotta cut this out and they don't listen and once is, is enough for you. We can't be those people. <laughs> if we wanna emulate the heart of Jesus towards sinners, gracious, patient, kind, calling them to repentance, and then we give them time to repent. The problem with this woman, she refused to repent. The word repent, I, I told you this all the way back in week one, it's a word that means to change your mind, and it's a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. This woman had no interest in changing direction. She was more interested in sexual pleasure than she was in living a life pleasing to Christ. And here's what I wanna say to you today out of care and concern. If the same is true for you, you should be very concerned about that. In other words, if you are someone who hears about sin and repentance and your natural reaction is to dig your heels in, I'm not changing. I'm not stopping. Like even now you hear me talking and you're offended that I'm saying what I'm saying. Like if that's your natural reaction to dig in, I'm not changing, you should be very concerned about that. Because for the believer in Christ, repentance is a no-brainer. And we have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. And part of his ministry to us, it's called sanctification. He is constantly working to rid us of us and make us more like Jesus who has saved us. And so for the believer in Christ, when our sin is brought to us, we want to change. We want to leave it behind. Why? Because we want to be more like Christ. And if you're not interested in that, I would say be very concerned because there's a good chance you don't know him. This was a woman who clearly did not know Christ. It's seen in the fact that she refused to repent, but it's also seen in the fact that Jesus was now preparing to judge her for her sin. Let me point some things out, okay? Number one, Jesus says, I will throw her onto a sick bed. This could be a general way of him describing judgment against this woman, or he could literally be talking here about sickness. I don't know. Um, we do see examples of that in the scripture. So 1 Corinthians 11, the church at Corinth, it was a church full of sin, full of division. They were coming to the communion table and partaking in this meal that's meant to remind us of the sacrificial death of Christ in our place for our sins. And because they were taking it in an unworthy manner, Paul says to them, you're getting sick and you're dying. You should probably deal with the sin in your lives and in your church before coming to the table because that's why you're getting sick and you're dying. We also read in 1 John 5, 16 that there is sin that leads to death. And it's really hard that the God of the universe could reach a point where someone is so bent on doing what they wanna do that he just decides, we're gonna be done here. We're gonna be done here. I don't know what Jesus is saying, but in some way he's getting ready to judge this woman for her sin. Number two, he says, those who commit adultery with her, I'll throw them into great tribulation unless they repent. Now, when he talks about committing adultery, he's not saying that these people were literally committing adultery with this woman. It's his way of saying they were following her in her sinful endeavors, her sinful pursuits. And the language is significant, listen, because it reminds us that sin is adultery. Sin is adultery. In both the Old and the New Testaments, the people of God are described as a bride. Israel, God's bride. Church, the bride of Christ. And so you and I, if we know him, we're, we're in a marriage-type relationship with him. We've entered into covenant with the God of the universe. 
And so to commit sin then, it's like a husband or wife going outside of the marriage and sleeping with somebody they're not married to. It's why in the Old Testament, God repeatedly called the nation of Israel whore when they chased after false gods and they acted like all the nations around them. I mean, I've said this repeatedly during my time here. Sin is more than the bad things that you do. It is you being unfaithful to the God you belong to. Yet, here's the grace of God. He gives adulterous people time to repent. Did you catch the language? I'll throw them in a great tribulation unless they repent. So here again is the heart of Jesus. He is like that faithful, long-suffering husband who's watching his wife go out every night. God only knows where she's going. God only knows what she's doing. And he's just faithful at home, just pursuing and loving and serving and waiting on her to come back. That is Jesus' heart toward sinful people. He does not delight in the death of the wicked. But he rejoices when people come and repent and put their faith in him. Number three, he says, I will strike her children dead. We're not talking literal children here. We're talking spiritual children. And so these were the people in the church who had bought into her false teaching, and they were living a life of compromise. And Jesus is saying, because of your compromise, you keep going down that road. I'm going to judge you just like I'm about to judge her. And in light of all this, Jesus says to all the churches, we're included in this, so just lean in. All the churches will know that he is the one who searches mind and heart, and he is the one who repays according to works. And so on a practical level, this letter to to Thyatira, it reminds us of two great truths, okay? Number one, Jesus hates sin. He hates it, despises it, is disgusted with it, so much so that he died for it. You see, we know from the scriptures, Romans 5, 8, that the cross of Jesus Christ, yes, it is a demonstration of God's love towards sinful people like you and me, but the cross of Jesus Christ is also a great demonstration of his hatred for sin. Jesus died to kill sin. He died to free us from its penalty. He died to free us from its power. And one day in the future, because of his death and resurrection, he will ultimately free us from its presence forever. He hates it. He died to overcome it. And one day he will kill it once and for all. Jesus hates sin. The second truth, Jezebel's cannot be tolerated. Jezebel's cannot be tolerated. Jesus does not tolerate them. You and I cannot tolerate them. Here's what I mean by that. When a crazy person shows up in the life of the church and starts preaching compromise, we obviously start by calling them to repentance. Whoa, I wanna flag you down here. Uh, Saying some crazy stuff doesn't line up with the word of God. If they repent, great, you get to stay. You get to be part of the family. If they refuse to repent and keep preaching their crazy nonsense, they must be removed. We have to put them outside of this body because if they stay within the body, they become a cancer in the body and they cause mass destruction. Jezebel's cannot be tolerated. Here's why. Because one of us is not more important than all of us. And I know that's hard for some of us to hear, especially in this very individualistic society in which we live that tells us all the time, you matter most. No, 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 really, you, you matter most. And the rest of us are just supposed to bend for you because the individual matters most. And I just wanna say to you out of love, no, you don't. And no, I don't. And in the church, this is especially true. Jesus is willing to remove individuals from his church to protect his church at large. And as his people, you and I must be willing to do the same. Jezebel's cannot be tolerated. Now, he says to the rest of us who don't hold the teaching of this crazy woman, which I love, he calls the deep things of Satan, by the way. So Jesus is reminding us that these false ideas come from Satan himself. The idea that you can live with one foot in the church and one foot in the world and ride the line of compromise is satanic. He wants you to believe that because he wants to destroy your life and rob God of the glory he rightfully deserves. Jesus says to those of you who haven't bought into that, I love this, I'm not gonna put any other burden on you. All I want you to do is hold fast until the day of my return. All right, I'm gonna give you some homework, okay? Uh, Acts chapter 15, I want you to go read that on your own time this week. This is where we find the, the account of what was known as the Jerusalem Council. 
This took place a short time after the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. And so it was no longer just Jew belonging to God. Now it was Jew and Gentile, Jews and non-Jews. God formed one new man. We see that in Ephesians chapter two, brought these two people groups together. And so now all the Jewish leaders in the church are trying to figure out, what do we do with all them? Like, what, what do we expect of them? Are they supposed to become Jewish? Do they all need to be circumcised? Let's have an altar call right now. Oh, you guys, come on down and let's, do they need to be circumcised? Like, that'd be horrible, right? Do they need to partake in our festivals? Do they need to follow all of our laws? Like, what do we expect of these people? So they had this council and they debated it all. Here's the conclusion that they came to by the grace of God, the help of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's just ask Gentile people to stay away from things that have been polluted by idols and to refrain from sexual immorality. That sounds easy enough, right? Wanna follow Jesus? Well, what do I need to do? All right, put your faith in him because salvation is faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone. And after you put your faith in him, just stay away from stuff associated with idols and refrain from sexual immorality. Sounds easy enough, doesn't it? Okay, here's the point Jesus is making in the text. I'm not gonna put any other burdens on you other than those. Here's why I'm telling you that. Jesus doesn't ask a whole lot of us. He doesn't. That's why he says in Matthew eleven thirty, to all who are weary, <laughs> to all who need rest, come to me. Why? Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. John says it in 1 John 5, 3, that the commandments of Jesus Christ are not burdensome. I know some of you think they are. Some of you think, oh, following Jesus, so burdensome. It's all about commands. It's all about rules. No, it's not. You know what Jesus wants from you? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't have any idols and stay sexually pure. Can we be honest? That is not a heavy burden to carry. The burden that Jesus Christ has put on our back, which by the way, he carries alongside of us, is a pretty light burden. And to those who carry it, Jesus promises two things. Look at verse 26. This is where we'll start to land. He says, the one who conquers and who keeps my works till the end, to him I will give authority over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. Even as I myself have received authority from my father and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. All right, here are the two promises. Number one, I will give him authority over the nations. So to the one who conquers, who endures, who holds fast, who carries the burden, authority over the nations. The language that you see there of ruling with a rod of iron, pots being broken into pieces, that again comes right out of Psalm chapter two. And Jesus is telling us that for those of us who hold fast to him, we will rule and reign with him. And I believe there are both present and future aspects to this promise because Jesus mentions the authority that has been given to him by the Father. And we see that authority being given at the end of Matthew's gospel, Matthew 28. Right, all the way back in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve, who possessed God-given authority to rule and reign over creation, they gave it to the enemy. We don't want this. We don't wanna do what God has called us to do so he can have it. Well, after his crucifixion and resurrection, Jesus took it back from the enemy. Like he conquered the enemy defeated the enemy, and he reclaimed that authority. Matthew 28 gets his disciples on this mountain in Galilee, and he says it. All authority in heaven and on earth belongs to me. And Jesus Christ now exercises that authority from his throne in heaven on the earth through us, his church. Right? He calls us to be lights in this dark world. He calls us to live salty lives, if you will, lives that slow down the decay brought on by sin. He calls us to go to all nations, to proclaim the gospel, to make disciples, and as we do those things, his authority expands. His kingdom grows. More men and women come under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ, and so in that way, we're ruling with Christ in present time. It's pretty fascinating. The future aspect of the promise, Revelation 22.5. We talked about this on Easter just a few weeks ago, that you and I will rule and reign with Christ in the new heavens and the new earth. And so after the day of his return, like everybody's raised up, we all have brand new resurrected bodies, judgment has taken place, new creation ushered in, all the enemies of God forever put to death. 
Jesus Christ will restore us to the purpose we see in the garden. Under his authority, we will exercise authority over all that God has remade. What a day that will be. That's promise one. Promise two, we get the morning star. We get the morning star. In Revelation twenty two sixteen, 16, Jesus identifies himself as the morning star. So here's the promise. We get him. You hold fast to him, faithful to him, you get him. And you get him now, right now. Like you don't have to wait to get him. You can experience a life-changing, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ right now. And if you're not experiencing that, I just wonder, maybe you're compromised. Like if you're someone that's like, well, why can't I experience Jesus like everybody else experiences Jesus? Here would be my question. Are you trying to live with one foot in the church and one foot in the world? Because if that's you, you're gonna miss out. You're not gonna get him. You're not gonna experience him. You might know him, but you won't know him in an experiential way. Like you wanna experience deep intimacy with Christ. At some point, you have to jump in with both feet and go hard after him. And if you do that, his promise, you're gonna get me. But then one day in the future, we'll get him in all of his fullness. Oh man, can you imagine that? Like he's finally here. Finally here. The resurrected, glorified Jesus is here wearing the scars that paid for our sins and we see him face to face, made like him in every way, with him for eternity, experiencing him without sin or brokenness standing in the way. One day, we will get King Jesus in all of his fullness. And so in light of all that, here's the question I wanna ask as we close. And this is where you gotta get really honest with yourself, okay? Here's the question. Who are you following? Jesus or Jezebel? Who are you following, Jesus or Jezebel? Are you holding fast to him or are you riding that line of compromise? One foot in the church, and one foot in the world. If you are holding fast to Jesus, I would say keep on holding fast. Keep growing in love and service and faith and endurance until the day you see him face to face. But if you are compromised, trying to be friends with both God and the world, here's Jesus' plea with you. Repent, repent. Change your mind on sin, change directions, go hard after him, and here's the beauty. The fact that you're here today listening to this sermon proves that Jesus Christ is being patient with you, that he's got love with you, that that, that he's got love for you, he's being gracious toward you. The fact that you're here proves he's giving you time to do this, and so do not waste this opportunity. Turn from sin and turn to Christ and then keep turning. You see, you gotta know that repentance is not a one-time thing, it's a daily thing. Because there's this part of, of all of us, it's broken, it's called the flesh, that is constantly attempting to draw us away from God and towards sin. And so repentance is this daily thing that we do where we say no to the flesh, by the power of the spirit, we put sin to death and we turn from it and we turn to Christ. And so if you need to start today, start today, but don't stop today. Let repentance be something that you do every day so that the Spirit of God can make you more and more and more like the one who saved you. And so right now in this moment, I'm just gonna ask us to bow. Our band's gonna come. And in just a moment, they're gonna lead us in a song and we're just gonna fix our eyes on Jesus. We're gonna sing about who he is, his glory, his majesty, his victory. We're gonna declare what we know to be true about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And my prayer is that as we do that, that God the Holy Spirit would just give us a hatred for sin. That as we see Christ in all of his beauty, that we would start to see our sin for what it truly is. And that he would give us the desire to turn, to repent, to leave that behind, to head toward Christ. And again, here's the simple invitation to you today. If you are compromised in some area, if you are compromised in some way, let today be the day where you start to turn. And so as the band leads us, we're gonna take time to pray and we're gonna take time to sing. We have communion tables if you wanna come and partake of this meal and remember what Christ has done for you. 
We got carpets down front. If you want to come and just get on your knees and pray and respond, however the Lord leads, that's what I want you to do. Father, would you come and work amongst us? Holy Spirit of God, we need you to do a work in us. And so we give you this time. It is yours. Use it for your glory and our good. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.